Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks so much to, uh, uh, to Professor Evo for introducing me. I'm very grateful uh, for his friendship over the years. Uh, and i um, really delighted to be here to talk about our new book. Uh, it's just out a few months ago, uh, written with Michael Rappaport, a good friend of mine from the University of San Diego, Originalism and the Good Constitution. And I think I'll begin by holding it up. Uh, that's what my editor said to do at every possible occasion. Okay, we'll even leave it so on. So, uh, so originalism and the good constitution, well, first of all, I guess I better describe why there needs to be a new book about originalism. One might think that everything's been said about originalism. After all, it's a venerable theory of interpretation. But we think that the justifications for originalism really aren't strong enough and have offered a new justification that we think uh, strengthens the case for originalism. And so let me just run through very briefly some of the traditional uh, uh, justifications for originalism and show why I don't think they at least uh, are awfully compelling. One is we should just be originalists because the framers were originalists. Well, that has obviously a certain circularity to it. Uh, another argument is that we should be originalists because originalism, that's the law. I don't think that's a great argument either. People are arguing for a common law constitutionalism or living constitutionalism aren't arguing that they're actually acting illegally and there are other uh, kinds of law that actually don't follow uh, a text, even if they begin with a text. And I guess the greatest difficulty with the argument that originalism is the law is that there are a lot of Supreme Court decisions that aren't originalist, and some explicitly so, and people seem to happily follow those decisions. So that can't be a great argument. Perhaps the most famous, at least in Federalist society circles, uh, uh, argument for originalism is Justice Scalia. Originalism leads to clear rules. I think there's a kernel of truth to that argument, but I don't think it can sustain the case for originalism. I mean, what if all the rules were very clear, but they were all rather bad? They led to bad consequences. That wouldn't be a great argument for following the original meaning of the Constitution. So we have a different argument for originalism, an argument that originalism leads to good consequences, better consequences, than the alternative theories. And I'll, first I'll just sketch out very, very briefly the three um, uh, propositions of this theory and then go into them at some greater length and deal with the two principal objections. The first uh, uh, proposition is that the best way of creating a good constitution is through stringent supermajority rules that gain consensus. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two is that our Constitution was created and is amended in the main through such stringent supermajority rules. And therefore, it follows that we should follow the meaning that got that supermajoritarian consensus. So that's the logic of the argument. And now let me go through each of the steps of the argument. The first step of the argument is that stringent supermajority rules are the best way of creating a good constitution. Now, they're not a perfect way of creating a constitution. They just likely lead to a good constitution, and there's no better way of creating it. And therefore, institutionally, we should follow uh, the way it was created. We see those kinds of institutional rules all across law. We don't say that the results in a criminal trial are always perfect, but because it's the best way we've conceived of uh, dealing with that process, we treat those results as final. Well, first, so let me discuss why stringent supermajority rules are a way of creating a good constitution. I think the easiest way to do so, at least in a short time, is to compare it with majority rule, that we think is, in general, something close to majority rule, the best way for creating ordinary legislation, good ordinary legislation. And the reason it does that, I think, is important because we build on that 
when we come to supermajority rules, we like democracy and like majority rule because it creates many minds to focus on a problem. And we think that is likely uh, to lead to better instrumental results than just having a few people focus on the problem. Secondly, we like uh, democracy and majority rule because it considers a lot of it people's interests. And we think that in a certain welfareist way, that considering a variety of people's interests, we're going to get to better results. So that's the reason we like majority rule for ordinary legislation. But it isn't very good for creating a constitution. Well, why? Well, a constitution is crucial to have a consensus framework for government. If you have uh, divisive constitutional rules, uh, you're going to lead to a kind of unraveling of the stability that a constitution is supposed to create. Now, of course, a supermajority rule, by its nature, creates consensus. You can't get it through a narrow uh, majority, but a substantial uh, a consensus. And you can't largely get it through a partisan majority. You've got to get buy-in uh, from uh, uh, two parties in a two-party system. And that's important because the Constitution then is more likely to become people's common bond, something that transcends the differences of ethnicity or geography and actually becomes part of, uh, of their affection uh, for their nation. So that's the first reason that stringent supermajority rules are a good way of creating a constitution. A second reason goes to the problem that we all have, a kind of heuristic problem, of thinking about the future. People, and psychologists tell us, too much think that the future is going to be like the past. Hence, housing bubbles and stock market bubbles that go up and up until they don't. So how does a stringent supermajority rule help us correct for that problem? It does so indirectly because only a relatively few kinds of proposals can likely get a stringent supermajority. Those that are subject to that, uh, uh, are proposed, are subject to an intense deliberation that is likely to correct for this problem uh, of looking for the future. So that's the second reason that uh, stringent supermajority rules are a better way of creating a constitution. The third reason is that a rule, uh, as in the Constitution, which requires a supermajority both to create a constitution and to amend it, creates what is called in the political science literature, and has been explored at great length, actually, by your own dean, uh, Dean Fitz, creates a veil of ignorance. And a veil of ignorance has some actually good qualities in creating a fundamental law. Because what a veil of ignorance does is it means that you can't be sure where you or your children are going to be 20 years from now. And that's good because that means you're less likely to consult your parochial interest, what you think of as just your particular, where your particular situation, but you're likely more to consult the public interest for the long term. And this is very concrete consequences for a constitution. For instance, you're just not going to calculate, am I going to be in power, in the, my party going to be in power in the next few years? You're not sure. Well, maybe you'll be in party in the next few years, but I can't be sure 20 years from now. And so you're more likely to create something like uh, freedom of speech, the ability to actually uh, contest elections. Uh, also, minority rights are more likely. You're not quite sure, at least in a pluralistic religious society, what religion your children are going to be. Or indeed, whether your religion, even if it's the majority religion now, will maintain its uh, majority. Uh, so that's another reason that we're li more likely to get something like freedom of religion. So all those things are very good about stringent supermajority rules for creating a constitution. And this is in the, in the abstract. Some of the most important aspects of our original constitution, what I would call the big bang of our constitutional universe, was created by these supermajority rules. The nationalists had to compromise with the anti-federalists, and that's why federalism was born. And in the process of ratification, it became quite clear that the constitution wouldn't be ratified because there was a, a substantial a group of people, maybe not a majority, but a certain a strong minority, that thought there needed to be a Bill of Rights. And so the Bill of Rights was created. So those are some very specific aspects of how a supermajority rule uh, creates 
uh, uh, very important aspects of our Constitution. So that's proposition number one. Proposition number two is that our Constitution was created in the main under these supermajority rules. That's very clear in the amendment process. The amendment process, two-thirds of the House and Senate, three-quarters of the states, uh, to pass a constitutional amendment. A little less clear in the original Constitution, but, in the, uh, but partly that's because the, the rules for creating the Constitution were created in the middle of, 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 of its creation. But we do see in Article 7, you had to require nine of the 13 states to create the new Constitution, a supermajority rule, and it's pretty clear that the Constitution wouldn't have gotten off the ground without a very substantial consensus to call the Constitutional Convention and a very substantial uh, supermajority rule, uh, supermajority of the delegates to pass it. It just wouldn't have gotten any uh, momentum. So there was consensus support uh, for the original Constitution, not unlike that uh, in the amendment process. Now, to be sure, there's one real problem in the original Constitution, the exclusion of African Americans and women. I'll get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, so if those are the pro two propositions, it follows that we should follow the original meaning, because what got the consensus by which the Constitution is likely good? It's the meaning at the time, not my meaning, not Ronald Dworkin's meaning, not Richard Posner's meaning, uh, not any particular justices on the Supreme Court's meaning. That's what got the consensus in virtue of which the Constitution is likely beneficent. One thing that follows actually from our brand of originalism, and I'll just mention this very briefly, is that of course the framers were not naive to think that all the Constitution was going to be clear, but they had interpretive rules that helped to resolve those meanings. And from our theory of the Constitution, it follows that these interpretive rules are also binding on us today. Because if that's how it was expected to resolve ambigu ambiguities or vagueness in the Constitution, that was also part of what got uh, the consensus uh, results uh, that make the Constitution good. So this is what we call original methods originalism. You should not only look at the original word meanings, but to resolve ambiguities and vaguenesses, you should look at the interpretive rules of the time. And let me just mention that I think this is an important general point about the Constitution. The Constitution was not created ex nihilo. It was created against the backdrop of common law rules. I think we too much think of the Constitution as sort of sprouting like Athena from Zeus's brow. The Constitution, though, is nested within our common law tradition of common law interpretations that may be very important to interpreting the Constitution. Or to put it another way, many people have talked about the Enlightenment heritage of the Constitution, but just as the American Revolution, indeed the Declaration of Independence, is partly a product of that Enlightenment heritage, it's also a product of the common law heritage. Uh, and I think our focus on the methods of interpretation that were extant at the time is reclaiming that heritage uh, for uh, originalism today. Well, let me then now just briefly end on what I think are the two possible big objections to this theory. One objection, which I don't think originalists really have dealt with very well, but I think comes clear from our theory, is the exclusion of African Americans and women. If what's important is to create a constitution by consensus, it's very problematic that some people were excluded from the original consensus, or largely excluded. And I think the problem actually, and here I may get in, uh, uh, the, the problem is even more intense for African Americans at the time, because we do have some evidence that women at the time tended to vote like their male relatives in any uh, respect, and so it's not clear that would have made a very large difference. But of course, it's obviously palpable in the face of the Constitution that the exclusion of African Americans did make a difference. Isn't that very troubling for originalism? And I think our book is the first book on originalism that really tries to deal systematically with that. And how do we deal with it? We first of all say it's very important. It's not at all clear that African Americans were even bound by the original Constitution because of this exclusion, in our view. But that that failure, and that was a big failure in the supermajoritarian process, has been followed by supermajoritarian correction. We've had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. 
that have given uh, African Americans uh, the right to vote and uh, the right against discrimination. We have the 19th Amendment that gives women the right to vote. So there's been substantial correction. So you might say, well, let's, let's consider more uh, 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 correction uh, for the Constitution. But we think that would be a big mistake because it's very hard to figure out uh, what is going to uh, be, what would have been added to the Constitution beyond these anti-discrimination and voting provisions, and of course provisions to get rid of slavery. And so it's a big mistake to go down that route of the nirvana uh, fallacy. So let me, before getting to the last problem, I think, of the Constitution, let me try to, having now described what I think ad the advantage about the process and the, and the uh, what may be the uh, most uh, prob problem, dealt with the, I think, the greatest problem, the exclusion of African Americans and women, trying to emphasize what's good about the supermajoritarian process of making a constitution versus the alternative, the living constitution, updating the constitution through the Supreme Court. I think it comes out very clearly because look how the Supreme Court rules as opposed to supermajoritarian if they're going to create new constitutional rights or try to update the constitution. The Supreme Court is not a continental supermajority. It's nine justices. And it's worse than that. There are nine elite lawyers who live in the most artificial city in the world, Washington, D.C. It's a little worse than that. It's nine elite lawyers who live in Washington, D.C., who all went to one of two law schools, Harvard and Yale. And as for geographic representation, well, at least I've heard they represent four of the five boroughs of New York City. So that really gives us some sense of what's the difficulty with the lack of uh, consensus uh, that you're going to get uh, through an updating of the Constitution uh, through by the majority vote of Supreme Court uh, justices. Let me end on what I think is the other big objection. Uh, to accepting originalism, the kind of common sense objection. Yeah, I think it would go something like this. Well, you've made a good case that uh, the supermajority rules were a good way of creating a constitution in 1789, and they probably worked pretty well for a while, with the very large exception of rules about slavery and the lack of rights for African Americans. Maybe they worked relatively well, they were relatively good or better than the alternatives, but the Constitution is really very old. It's written by people who are long dead, people who lived off and wore wigs. Why, why shouldn't we update it today? I think that's how, why should we be an originalist when we have an old supermajoritarian Constitution? I think that's a powerful objection to originalism. And I think we meet this head on in the book. It was a good Constitution, a good Constitution, the kind of Constitution that's likely created by supermajority rules is going to build in ways of dealing with change. And the framers had a variety of ways of dealing with this. First of all, they gave substantial discretion to the political branches to deal with change. Indeed, the states have very few restrictions on their new uh, ideas and new propositions that they can bring to the table, new rights they can create. Just parenthetically, let me state that I think it's been federalism that has been more responsible for changes in sexual mor mores and sexual autonomy uh, in this nation than any dictates of the Supreme Court because people living in less tolerant jurisdictions went to places like San Francisco or New York and publicized their lifestyle and showed how that it didn't create many dangers uh, for the republic and still allowed the benefits of people pursuing uh, their own uh, vision of uh, the good life. And so I think federalism is a very powerful way of allowing uh, the world uh, to change. Moreover, another way the framers uh, uh, created a, way, a constitution that could change is it created, they created principles, principles that may have had fixed meanings, but that may have changed in scope over time. I think an excellent example of this is the Commerce Clause. Even if we keep the meaning the same, because we now have more interstate commerce, the Congress has more power uh, because of that. So that's another way of having addressed change within the Constitution. And of course, the most important way 
the framers deal with change is the constitutional amendment process. That's a way uh, that people can address change. Now, it's often thought, and I think this is the large attack on the amendment process, that it's just too hard. And that's why we need non-originalism. That's why we need these justices to update the Constitution. I think that has it actually backwards. It's non-originalism that has eviscerated the amendment process. Through the 18th and 19th centuries, when originalism was strong, we had very substantial amendments that changed the character of our polity. I've already talked about the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendments. But of course, I would add the progressive amendments, the 17th Amendment, the direct election of senators, the income tax, something that obviously has an effect on everyone almost every day of their life who works for a living, uh, the 19th Amendment that gives women the right to vote. These were transformative social amendments, and they were passed through the amendment process, at least the last three, with essentially the same number of states we have today. Uh, in, so, so and it's also important to note that these amendments were often passed against vested interests. The states, the state legislatures gave up their rights to appoint senators. The, it was largely a male electorate that agreed to dilute their vote by giving the right to women. So this shows that amendments, far-reaching amendments, can be passed under our amendment process. Of course, after uh, the decline of originalism, it's become harder to pass amendments, precisely because of that decline. There are two ways that non-originalism uh, creates uh, arrows at the heart of the amendment process. First, by anticipating what we think, what the judges think where society is, they take the winds out of the sails of social movements that might want to amend the Constitution. It becomes less important to amend the Constitution. And by creating a culture of non-originalism, they make people trust the court less to interpret the amendments according to their terms. And both of these causes were, at the, were really at the, at the root of the death of the Equal Rights Amendment for women. The Supreme Court had already given substantial uh, equal rights uh, had already uh, begun that process. And, of course, the ERA came up against the backdrop of the Warren Court, the court that was the most extravagantly and sometimes explicitly non-originalist court uh, in the nation's history. If that was the case, why were you going to give another blank check uh, to that court uh, to uh, change uh, uh, the Constitution again uh, in the way it chose. That was just too dangerous. So that's the problem. If you have non-originalism, people aren't going to put their efforts into changing the Constitution according to this good way, a way that's likely to get good results. They're going to do something very different. They're going to try to change the uh, people on the court, or then they're going to try to change the constitutional culture to a culture of non-originalism where judges can fabricate a new constitution. So I think, the mo in some sense, I think the most important contribution of this book is to show how not originalism and the amendment process are inextricably intertwined. Only Originalism is only going to work if one has an amendment process to allow the constitution to change with changing times. But similarly, the amendment process is only going to be effective if we have originalism to prevent alternative ways of creating a constitution. So originalism and the amendment process march under the same banner. And what does that banner read? It reads, we the people rule here through constitutional politics, not we the elite judges. And I think that's an aesthetically a uh, pleasing result, as well as a good result. Because what does that mean? It, may, it forces us to understand again that the Constitution, like other great achievements in civilization, is not the work of we the people of any one generation. Each generation can add their own values to the Constitution uh, as it respects the previous generation's work. 
and each generation can add its values, so long as we have a culture of originalism, with the security that the next generation will respect its work. In some sense, I think, the Constitution, uh, at least as interpreted according to its original meaning, is an instantiation of Burke's, I think, great understanding that any great society is a uh, pact between the dead, the living, and the yet unborn. That's what the mechanism of constitutional change built into the Constitution, interpreted according to its original meaning, still gives us today. Thank you very much. mentioned that there's the common law background of the Constitution, but within common law ideology, it, common law ideology is very, is for the most part, non-originalist. So if this is part of the background of the Constitution, is it not possible that the framers themselves were believing in that? It certainly is possible. Um, we look in the book at that actual possibility, but when I say the common law background of the Constitution, I'm really talking about the common law understanding of how we interpret text that there were certain meanings, for instance, expressio unius, uh, of their various maxims and canons. I think that maybe that's the way to say there were common law canons to interpret the Constitution. It's not the case that people thought uh, the Constitution should be interpreted in an evolving or common law way. If you go back to the original uh, debates in the early republic, they really all had in common uh, uh, under, trying to understand the Constitution as it was written. Sometimes there were debates about what were the relevant interpretive rules. In some sense, that's a big debate in McCulloch versus Maryland uh, when um, uh, the opponents of the bank uh, suggest that the Constitution should be read with strict construction because it's the states uh, that were the creators of the Constitution. And Marshall rejects that rule uh, of interpretation. But if you look at uh, the way the Constitution is argued at the time, I do not think there's that evolving understanding. And the way I think w we understand original methods, originalism, is it brings canons of interpretation to text that the common law had refined over time. Yes? According to Grant, originalism is um, the Constitution's supermajority ratification. It wasn't a smaller population that Sure. Uh, well, I, I've already described the problem with the African Americans and uh, women, and that's a serious problem. The uh, best evidence is we have around 85 percent of, uh, of white males were eligible to vote. Now, it's true that not a lot of, not a huge number of people actually voted, but uh, I'll come, if you just let me finish, and I'm delighted to take your uh, question again. But that, there are a variety of reasons for that. Indeed, some people think that uh, people were very, as maybe they were today, um, segregated in beliefs by where they were. So they were pretty confident who was going to be representing them in this area. They were of like views in western Massachusetts, like views in Boston. Uh, uh, but uh, there was uh, still a uh, cross-section of people eligible to vote, at least among white males of relatively a large uh, uh, cross-section. And so we got, I think, uh, there's no reason to believe we didn't get a representative group of those 85 percent. Now, be sure they were a small number of people. There was a smaller population at the time. Right, so it's a smaller population. It's a fairly homogenous uh, population compared to today. Doesn't that sort of undermine the credibility of the, uh, of the supermajority if it's, if it's not a huge group? No, well, I, I certainly look so, so we deal with the problem of women and, and African Americans. That is a problem, and the question is, what's the alternative? Is it better for judges to try to figure that out? It's not really, uh, we think, better. You say the homo homogeneity, well, there actually, I, I, there are a lot of different interests represented. Just because people <laughs> were all white males, they were of very different classes of society. Some were farmers, some were... Um, uh, merchants, some were uh, uh, people of one religion, other people were of other religions. They looked at problems uh, from different perspectives. I don't think it's as problematic as you think. And again, the question is compared to what is the alternative? 
uh, the alter- <laughs> maybe that wasn't <laughs> the most uh, uh, variegated population. I still think it looks more various uh, than the uh, justices on the Supreme Court. It's hard to come up with a group of people who in some sense are less hetero- heterogeneous than those people from one uh, aspect. They're extremely uh, uh, elite uh, uh, groups of people. It's not the case that the Constitution was eligible only to the extreme elite at the time. So again, one of the points of this book is to avoid the nirvana fallacy. There may be some defects. We have to look at the alternatives. And so I don't think that the fact, and as I say, we, I certainly think the problem of women and, minor, and uh, African Americans is problematic, but I don't think the problem, I mean, indeed, at that time, there were even people, people who didn't speak uh, English. So in some sense, there was more heterogeneous. The Philadelphia, uh, very interestingly, the, in, in, in Pennsylvania, one of the first acts before the ratification, before even the votes on ratification, was to publish um, uh, translations of the Constitution in German. Yes? Okay, but in this comparison of, that continuously references the court as being so homogenous, doesn't that sort of miss the fact that the court also doesn't arise ex nihilo? It's appointed by people who are represented, and there's a approval process, and there's political backlash from bad appointments. It's not as though there's just these nine people who surface from Yale and are all of a sudden in power. That's absolutely true. On the other hand, uh, these people, precisely because of the Constitution, it's not as if they're uh, then subject to any um, control by these uh, political actors. And it's uh, the case uh, that the Constitu- that um, uh, first of all, that the court often rules uh, in ways that aren't uh, considered uh, the original Constitution. Or, uh, or, or actually reflects majority wishes. They reflect, I mean, I think political scientists think, essentially reflect maybe elite majority opinion. Secondly, even if it does reflect majority opinion, that's not really enough. Because we've as suggested that really uh, the advantage of a, uh, of a uh, good constitution is that it reflects consensus before one encodes constitutional change in the Constitution. And I think even if these people are appointed by the President, there's no likelihood that these uh, reflect the kind of consensus. There's nothing in the mechanisms that suggests it's going to reflect the kind of consensus that is any way comparable to a constitutional amendment. And one of the important claims in our book is that a mere majority isn't so great. Uh, and I think you're going to get less than a mere, it's not a good way even of capturing mere majority sentiment, but it's a really bad way of uh, capturing consensus sentiment. Yes? Absolutely possible, and that's why, and that's why we actually, you know, don't follow. Uh, try to figure out what the intent in their mind is. We try to look first of all at the public meaning uh, of the words, rather than trying to figure out some rationales. And then we may look to the accepted rules of interpretation at the time. Those avoid uh, that uh, problem. It may well be, right, that um, though that you've got to go with, uh, uh, with, with, the, uh, with those kinds of uh, public meanings without actually counting up whether there's a supermajority in, fra- in favor of any meaning itself. That's a different question. And I think you would say that actually is sort of simply reflected in the tradition of legal interpretation at the time. You generally don't go and try to figure out how many people thought this and how many people thought that, either in the legislature or in the general populace, because for the, I'm sure some of the reasons uh, that prompted you to ask that question. Yes?
Uh, well, I don't think so. I mean, I think we, we, we pretty, I mean, first of all, let me say why we think we need to have a welfareist justification of originalism, because uh, you know, we're essentially welfareists. We don't think it's a great argument. We just should do something because we should do it, or because it's the language demands that we do it. It's the demands of grammar. That doesn't seem to us, A, likely to persuade any people for a very long time. We don't think it's a very good argument. So that's why we have a welfareist justification. Now, I don't think we accept, and this I think we're in general in agreement with originalists, that we're doing violence to the meaning of the time. I mean, the, what's common among all originalists, and one of the most interesting things that what's going on in the academy, I think originalism has now become more intensely studied and discussed than at any time in my 20 years, is I think all originalists agree on some propositions, or at least 90% of them do, that the meaning of the Constitution is fixed at the time it was enacted, or the time the amendment was enacted. It doesn't change. So our theory doesn't do violence to the meaning. We're trying to find the positive meaning of the Constitution, that it's fixed at the time. And uh, the fact that the words may change in the meaning, and words certainly do drift over time, I think most originalists would say is completely uh, irrelevant. I mean, the famous example is the domestic violence clause in the Constitution. Well, domestic violence means something different today than it did in 1789, but no one would say, well, let's talk about in Article 4 domestic violence in that, in that way. So, Arth, we have a positive theory of meaning as well uh, in our book, and our positive theory of meaning, and what, what is controversial about our positive theory of meaning is not that that meaning is fixed, that's common in originalists. We would claim that not only is the meaning constituted by the rules of grammar, uh, help, dictionaries may help us find it, but actually the rules of interpretation. We do not make a sharp distinction between the rules of interpretation extent at the time also constitute the meaning. That, I think, is what's controversial by a theory. I think there's a strong arguments that the Constitution contemplates that. The Constitution often is obviously talking about legal meaning. It declares itself a legal document. The Ninth Amendment, I think, is written to prevent a certain kind of rule, uh, rule of expressio unius to be applied to the Constitution. Even the Supremacy Clause itself, uh, in its end, anything to the contrary notwithstanding, is a way of blocking a kind of interpretive rule that otherwise the framers feared would be applied, a kind of harmonization rule. So I think there's enormous evidence uh, that the interpretive rules are important to constituting the meaning of the Constitution. I think that's what's controversial about our positive theory of meaning, not that we believe the meaning of the words are fixed. Yes? Uh, if we thought that was a better well method, yes, yes, I think it, I, we don't think it's a better method. In some sense, we we talk about some of the alternatives to that, but I think that's the right. I think that's right. Uh, we would we would obviously have to say that ultimately our justification is on welfareist grounds, and if there are better ways of getting to human welfare, uh, we we'd have to agree to that. In some sense, our book is an argument. There aren't better ways of doing that, and just let me just say one important point. I think there's a picture of human psychology that is a, an assumption in our book. Uh, we, uh, while we're not rule utilitarians, we think we have to act as if there are rules uh, because people are partial. Uh, they're likely to, um, uh, uh, particularly in politics, they're likely not to uh, deal with their opponents fairly. And so our view is the, that's a great virtue of originalism, rather than some argument that well, we should be, we should look at the original meaning, but let's consider that pretty seriously. But consider other things too. We think that's never going to be a stable equilibrium for that reason. So we try to address that point that there might be things that look a little like originalism, but can't we move a little a bit away from originalism, and we'll still be better off. 
we don't think so, and I think the reason we don't think so is we think the, that uh, there's a lack of stability, particularly because once you, once you go down that, particularly in a multi-member court where people say, well, you've, you're not being fair uh, in your mixed interpretation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start diverging myself, that's not a recipe uh, for preserving much, if any, of originalism at all. Yes? So, obviously, a welfareist argument says that's not good, right? Freedom is better than slavery. Um, right. So then we have a conflict between welfare and the original meaning. But do you say the original meaning is not binding in that case? Well, as I suggested, no. Uh, without the correction of the 14th, 15th Amendments, I'm not at all sure. So it's very interesting that that's the example you give, right? I mean, I, because it's not all sure to me that the Constitution is binding, at least with respect to any African Americans or anything connected to that at the time. So I, I think I would, that's what I would first say. I mean, it's very different in our world uh, because uh, I, there's real supermajoritarian defects in that, in that world. In general, just because something is, um, uh, I don't think it's uh, welfareist. And there are a lot of things in the Constitution I could think I could improve on. Indeed, I think I've got a great Constitution in my back pocket, that really be better for everyone to be governed by, right? It's much better on welfareist grounds. Well, right, should I say? That should be my constitution? Pretty obviously not. Because even if I think that's the best constitution, that's not the best constitution for the United States. The consensus aspect of the constitution is actually part of its welfareist uh, uh, aspects. Uh, so uh, I think uh, one other aspect of this is a very institutional view that it's you know, hard to know. We have our own individual ideas of what's just and uh, what's right, but it's very important to have a process of multiple minds that goes to that. So if you can't persuade other people of that, we don't think it's likely to be as quite as unjust, again, if you have the right kind of, if you've got the right kind of process. So again, I think that's an implicit assumption about how best to realize welfareism uh, in a world where people are partial uh, to their own, uh, to their own somewhat times idiosyncratic views of welfare, and in which, for a society in which people have to deal with one another, consensus is absolutely essential for our framework document. Yes. No, I think it's a great, great question, and the, at the end of the book, we try to address that problem, right? Uh, how, how, how can one envision uh, an originalist constitution? Uh, because it seems to be dependent on Supreme Court justices, and I think the argument is, well, it's an originalist culture. If you go back to the Marshall Court, uh, there are, court, there are, there are uh, uh, justices, you know, well, it's called the Marshall Court. For most of the Marshall Court, a majority, indeed maybe a supermajority of the justices are appointed by Democratic Republican as opposed to a Federalist uh, presidents. And yet there's an enormous consensus, I think, both about originalism and a pretty strong consensus about the interpretations of the Constitution. So we think ultimately it's dependent not so much simply on presidential appointments, but on an originalist culture, it it's makes matter. I mean, it may, even, you can even change justices on the bench, not perfectly, we're never going to get perfectly, with the culture of the time. What do judges maximize once they're on the bench? Well, they maximize uh, their, um, Judge Posner, who's sur surely, who's an instrumentalist, says, well, they sort of maximize, they'd like, first of all, the rules of the game, and so the rules of the game 
start changing and the legal ideas of what's good legal craft changes. They'll just like to play it. They also like respect for their peers. I think we'd have a very different world if most of our law schools, most of our law professors were originalists and critiqued the Supreme Court justices' opinions on originalist grounds rather than on, well, I don't want to be unkind to most law professors, but their own peculiar theories of the good. There, I've been a little unkind to them. Uh, that would be a very different world from the world we're in. So I don't think it's just dependent on uh, uh, appointments by the president, but by the culture of originalism. And I don't think that should be that surprising. Uh, I found it upsetting when I sort of figured this out, that ultimately originalism depends on culture. But most of our great achievements depend on culture. Surely many people have argued that free markets depend on certain cultural attachments and habits of mind. I don't think things are any different in constitutional uh, theory. At the end of the book, while we're not uh, Pollyannish, we give some reasons for optimism that originalism is making tremendous strides. Uh, we not only now have two justices who are, I think, thoroughgoing originalists on the court, we have other justices who are sympathetic to originalism, uh, uh, in cases at least where there's not a substantial amount of precedent. Uh, we haven't discussed how our book deals with precedent. Um, but, uh, and uh, at no point uh, in my time in the academy have originalist ideas been, been considered more respectfully. There, I think there's a great revival of originalism. So I'm not, we're not anywhere close to having those kinds of faculties I've described, uh, consistent theater critics of the court from an originalist perspective. Uh, uh, but we're a lot closer there uh, than we were uh, 20 years ago. And that, I do think, is the kind of thing that's required, even more than presidential appointments, although some of those would be, to be sure, to be nice, uh, to change uh, us back to a more originalist way of uh, addressing these questions. Very good. You should hear him. I know him very well. <laughs> <laughs>